Good uh, evening, everybody. Just waiting for the last few people to uh, join us uh, via the waiting room. You're uh, all very welcome indeed. Welcome to um, session four in Sheffield uh, Hallam University Space and Place Group's uh, series of events themed this year around exploring. Uh, and this evening uh, we'll be uh, jumping onto your bike and talking about mountain biking. Uh, my name's Luke Bennett. I'm the uh, coordinator of this uh, group and you're all very welcome here this evening. Uh, and uh, just a few opening words by me to set the scene and then I'll be handing over to uh, Jim Charrington who's going to um, run the show um, for the rest of the evening. So Let's get it uh, on the way. We can have four main presentations. I'll tell you what those are in a moment. Uh, the event will finish at 9.30 p.m. Um, and uh, I'm, I'll be quite strict about ending it by 9.30 because obviously people will be wanting to go off and do other exciting things. Uh, please do comment and raise questions in the chat as we go along. Um, and we'll pause uh, and Jim will convene and coordinate a Q&A after each presentation. And if we've got some time left at the end, which I hope we will have, uh, there'll be plenty of uh, scope for a panel uh, type discussion. Uh, this event is currently being recorded and it'll be recorded throughout the duration of the uh, session uh, for uh, upload eventually to uh, the group's YouTube site. And we um, upload raw uh, without editing um, the proceedings. That's pretty much for my convenience. Uh, so we haven't got to re-render and so on everything. Um, please therefore bear that in mind when contributing uh, to the event today. If you do inadvertently say something that you really wish you hadn't and that you wish hadn't been captured on video for posterity, you've got a 24 hour window uh, to contact me uh, by seven o'clock tomorrow uh, evening on the email that's showing on the screen and uh, beg me to um, agree to edit the video, which I will do if needs be, but we'll do so quite reluctantly because it's a real faff um, compared to just doing a raw upload. Um, the group uh, has been running online for the last three and a bit years, ever since COVID pushed us in this direction. And we um, have an annual theme and therefore uh, recorded sessions in relation to each of those themes, building up a nice resource bank of interdisciplinary converse conversations. Uh, the online format enables us to reach out to um, colleagues and partners around the world, which is really nice to uh, have, uh, uh, have that interaction. The Exploring series has um, gone through uh, four modes, four territories of uh, exploration. We started off uh, pottering around in ruins. Uh, we then went underground and we clambered on rocks. And uh, uh, this evening you're, uh, you're jumping on your bike. Um, each of those sessions has been um, an interdisciplinary set of presentations. Uh, I'm not going to read through uh, what you can see on each screen, but I uh, just commend them to you should you wish to explore the exploration uh, series. Um, and uh, as with, uh, as with the previous three uh, sets of events, uh, this evening uh, we're going to be um, uh, rounding out the theme by looking essentially at contemporary exploration uh, and, and not being too bashful about it, but equally not being too, too much full of bravado. You know, what is the, the lived reality of people who choose in a modest or daily or, 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 or weekend sort of way to go off exploring? Why do they do it? How do they do it? Um, next year... Uh, 2024, our theme is going to be perceiving climate change, so a slight change of uh, change of tack, looking at it elementally uh, in the modes of ice, water, heat and social action. Uh, so if you are finding that of an appealing prospect, please keep an eye on our event cube site, which is the um, registration uh, service that we now use um, uh, ever since event bright started charging for free events, which is a naughty. Um, so that's the link for uh, uh, signing up and keeping an eye on our future events. If you want to be, join our um, emailing list, you're more than welcome to do so. Just drop me an email uh, and I'm happily uh, going to I'll happily add you to our list. So for this evening, uh, these are the uh, presenters. Um, we operate a pretty sort of flat, informal approach here, whereby we allow presentators present we encourage presenters to um, introduce themselves. They're the best people. They know themselves the best rather than us bigging people up with uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some pre-given script. 
Um, and the connecting theme for the contributions that you're going to hear tonight um, are uh, that they are all featured in um, Jim's new edited collection that you see on the screen here. Um, the QR code that will take you to the Routledge Publishers page and the book's out on the 15th of February. Jim, I've done this plug for you so that you don't have to um, feel embarrassed about doing it yourself, but by all means, if you want to fortify the plug at any point later, you are more than uh, uh, welcome to do so. So that's enough from me. I'm going to now slink off into the background. I'll be here all evening, listening in, trying to make sure that the car doesn't crash. Um, but uh, Jim, I'm going to stop sharing now and uh, over to you. Thanks, Luke. Appreciate that. And, uh, and thanks as ever for facilitating the session. I will just load my slides. Um, I'll assume you can all see that unless I'm told otherwise. Um, yeah, it's loaded up. Great. I hope you can all hear me okay as well. Um, yeah, so thanks again, Luke. Um, and thanks everybody for, for coming to the session. Um, always difficult to find a time that suits everybody, but seven o'clock seems like a, a fairly good time on a weeknight, or unless you're in another part of the world where the time is completely different, of course. Um, as Luke said, my name's Jim Sherrington, uh, and if you don't know me, I'm a senior lecturer and researcher at Sheffield Hallam University. As ever, it's it's a real pleasure to, to speak to members of the, the place uh, Space and Place group, as well as um, other people are able to join us today. Uh, and I'm, I'm genuinely looking forward to some really enriching discussion with some familiar faces that I can see and, and some not so, not so familiar faces. So the main point of today's session, of course, is to officially launch the, 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 the book Mountain Biking Culture and Society. This is the, the, first, um, the first book launch of two that we have planned. There's another one in, in January. Um, and the book's due to be published by Routledge in February. So I don't actually have a, a discount code as I normally would for the book yet, but I'll be in touch um, for those of you that are interested with that a bit later on. Before I get to the the, the kind of uh, nuts and bolts of, of what I'm going to do today, I just want to share two stories with you from research that uh, myself and my colleague Jack Black, who's on the call today, have been conducting on mountain biking over the last kind of six years or so. And the reason I want to do this is I think it, it will help to locate um, the book in a, in a more in a kind of visceral and meaningful way. Um, now, if it's OK by everyone on the call, I'm going to assume it is. I'm going to do this, take this approach, rather than providing a textbook definition and static definition of mountain biking, because I'm going to assume that by virtue of you being here today, you already have some sense of what mountain biking might be. OK, so the first story I've got for you is from someone for the purposes of, of anonymity and, and confidentiality, we'll call Julie. Um, I met Julie while I was doing a talk for the Mountain Bike Structures Award scheme last year. And Julie um, was one of only two or three women in a room of about 40 people when I, when I gave this talk. And that, that's something I'll come back to a bit later on in my presentation. But on a more positive note, Julie was telling me how she uses mountain biking to change the lives of young people with disabilities and mental health problems. And what I found really fascinating about this, which I guess is especially prescient given um, the risk averse nature of contemporary societies is that she was doing this by deliberately, but of course responsibly, exposing these individuals with these issues to risk on a mountain bike at their request. And so what they were doing, and what Julie was doing with them, was, was essentially pushing boundaries with them on, on bikes. She was getting them to step outside of their comfort zones by doing things like small jumps or um, sessioning corners or what we call berms in mountain biking. Um, and to experiment with, she was getting them to experiment with a form of physical activity that in some cases these um, young people had never had the chance to do before. Now, what she was saying to me, which was equally interesting, was that some of these people crashed, some of them got a few cuts and bruises, but she was telling me that when she asked for feedback at the end of these interventions, the vast majority of the riders said that they felt empowered by the chance to take control over their bodies in ways that previous interventions or, or physical activity initiatives hadn't really allowed. And I don't know about you, I know we've got a few people on the call who are involved in these kinds of worlds, but I, I just think that's fantastic for reasons that I'll explain shortly. The second was a chap we'll, we'll call Mark, again, for confidentiality reasons. It's not his real name. 
Um, and I met Mark when I was interviewing people about e-mountain bikes um, two years ago. Mark was in the army, in the military, and he stepped on an IED, which, if you don't know, is an improvised explosive device while he was on a tour of Afghanistan. Um, fortunately, Mark didn't lose any of his limbs in the accident uh, or the explosion, but he did have significantly reduced um, mobility in his legs as a result of that of that incident. Now, Mark used to be, he was telling me he used to be mad for mountain biking, but for obvious reasons now, he, he kind of struggles to do it in the way that he'd like. Um, and he confided in, 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 in me at numerous points during the interview and my conversations with him that the mental toll this took on him was so heavy that he'd contemplated suicide on numerous occasions, unfortunately. But what was great about Mark's interview is that when I spoke to him about buying an e-bike, and I'll just read this verbatim if you don't mind, because I think this is really powerful. He said, to say it, i.e. the e-bike, was life-changing is quite an understatement, really. Essentially, I then realised that I could go properly mountain biking again. I went and qualified for a course that was facilitated to help help the help for heroes, excuse me, which, if you don't know, is a UK-based charity for uh, veterans of war. Then I went and qualified as a trail leader and came back home to set up a club at the school I was working at. On the first day, I expected to get half a dozen lads who would want to go and jump bikes in the woods, but we wound up with over 50 kids. Now I'm training as a level two mechanic and the scope for the impact that we could have on people is mind boggling. Essentially, this all stems back to me getting an e-mountain bike and being able to start riding again. It has literally saved my life. So quite, quite a powerful story that, I'm sure you'd agree. But what's the point of me telling you these stories uh, and why am I telling you about these people in the context of this book? Well, we might be mistaken for thinking that the individuals in these stories uh, are being helped by the bikes um, or indeed the technology behind the bikes. We might also be mistaken for thinking that these are just isolated acts of, um, in Mark's case, bravery or heroism. But as well as being lovely stories, I think these instances tell us quite a lot about uh, things like people and, and places and, and those collective forms of practice and culture that comprise our world of mountain biking. I think importantly, they also tell us a little bit, as per Julie's story, about the kinds of people that are being left out uh, or underrepresented in these worlds, as well as the types of controversy that, that mountain bike cultures and practices might cause or entail. So in Mark's case, like many e-mountain bikers, and this is common, he was telling me about quite a few stories about how he'd been judged or in some cases abused verbally um, on the trail for requiring assistance. And, and I think this definitely gives us as mountain bike scholars food for thought when we think about the rise of things like e-mountain biking technology as it becomes more and more popular. But then we've got the question of what we mean by the term culture. Um, and in, in accounting for the growth of mountain biking in the last few decades, a number of people, a number of scholars um, have highlighted mountain bikers affinity with, with what's often described as a, a subcultural kind of identity. Uh, and, and this subcultural identity um, it is where riders might share a disenchantment with contemporary fitness cultures that uh, can sometimes, as we know, revolve around things like discipline, bodily conformity, a resistance to being in artificial environments and a, a more a, a closer relationship with nature and so on. Um, and they also involve and emphasize things like informality, grassroots participation over professional participation um, and um, artistry and creativity over those values that might relate um, by contrast to things like utility or competition. And on the surface, this all seems pretty straightforward and obvious, and it's, it's quite a commonplace explanation for um, what might broadly be described as extreme sports or lifestyle sports. But as many of you on the call today will, will appreciate, mountain biking doesn't always, I find, fit neatly into these really tight, um, watertight definitions. So uh, Katrina Mervyn Brown, whose uh, work I massively admire, as you'll, as you'll see if you read the book, um, she talks about how mountain bikers describe very differently to the, the, the kind of ideological version of what constitutes a mountain. And on this, she, she, she talks about how there's a wide um, a continuum of associations that mountain bikers have with a mountain. Um, and, and there are different kinds of riders who are more or less wedded to these ideals. 
So for example, why should an amateur cross-country mountain biker or a bike packer, um, as, as Claire will talk about shortly, might associate with the rubric of things like isolation and, uh, and self-independence, as well as notions of an, a more authentic and romantic wilderness. A pro enduro rider or downhill orientated rider or, or park rat, as they're often known, um, might have a closer association with more civilised and less romantic um, renditions of the mountain due to the assistance they receive um, from things like uh, from, from support staff, from chairlifts, shuttle services and so on. Then in a whole different category, you've got people um, like myself, for example, who don't you know i consider myself a mountain biker but i don't really have that much of an affinity to either geographically or symbolically to, to mountains a very little of my riding takes place in mountains i do it in the suburbs but i would still class myself as a mountain biker so while it's really tempting often to to imagine an overarching subculture in which everyone you know smokes weed hooks big jumps and uh slurps on red bull i think for me, it's much more useful to think about, and this is how I frame the book, to think about contemporary mountain bike cultures as consisting of often disparate small groups of participants with their own sets of motivations, goals and identities. And here, as you'll see in the introduction of the book, I've uh, borrowed a term from uh, called the structure of feeling from Raymond Williams, which I really like. Because what this has allowed me to do is allow me to conceptualize how mountain biking is performed, experienced and habitually understood by individual mountain bikers, whilst at the same time accounting for the differences within and between different members of the mountain bike community, which is reflected in many of the chapters we've got in the book. And uh, I've put a quote up here from Williams, because I think this caveat is important in Williams' own words, because he says, that the complexity of a culture is to be found not in its variable processes and their social definitions, traditions, institutions and formations, but also in the dynamic interrelations at every point in the process of historically varied and variable elements. So in simple terms, for me, mountain biking is always going to be more than um, a handling of fixed forms and, and, and strictly held units. Um, there's always going to be a tension between um, the received interpretation of mountain biking, which would include things like the ideologies of rational sport, but at the same time that would include practical experience, um, so riding a mountain bike and actually participating in mountain bike culture. And it's this tension between these two things that becomes a symptom of a, a form of experience which in many cases can be difficult to verbally articulate. So for me then, riding a mountain bike and participating in mountain bike culture can induce a feeling of togetherness, of mutual belonging, of a collective habitus, if you like. But at the same time, it can also distance individuals from those practices that don't necessarily reflect their own view. And at the minute, we see this all the time in mountain biking, and again in the chapters in this book, because it's reflected in the wide variety of different and often conflicting um, mountain bike subdisciplines from things like cross country to more gravity, gravity orientated styles, such as enduro and downhill, that have emerged over the last, almost in the last decade or so. So how does this relate to the book? Well, I've just finished, thank God, finish, I've just finished the index off for the book. Um, I did it myself on this occasion. And what was actually, Jack kept telling me this would be the case, but what was really nice about it was that um, it showed me how, despite lots of different and very varied chapters, we've got 13 chapters overall, 14 including mine, there were clearly some topic areas coming up that cut across all of these chapters. And that's what's always nice about an index. So I just thought by way of a very quick pub quiz, I wondered if, mountain bikers on the call could maybe have a guess at what the three most popular terms were that appeared in this index. What would you expect the three most frequently used terms in a book on mountain biking to be? Either shout it out or stick it in the chat. I'll go with embodied. Um, spot on. Uh, bodies was third in the list with 46 mentions. Nice one, Claire. Any other thoughts? I'm not keeping an eye on the chat. Can 
Come on, someone give me one more suggestion. No, no takers? Okay. I'll say, I'll say climate, just to give you another. Ah, so, so it wasn't climate per se, Claire, but it was environment. So environment was second with 47 mentions. Uh, disappointed in, in, in uh, Jeff, um, Oliver and Jake there, because the, the first mention was in fact the media. So we've got media with 49 mentions, environment with 47, bodies and gender with 46, and then sh followed shortly thereafter by risk, nature and technology. So um, obviously this is in part reflected in the focus of the book, which was, which was good. Um, but as with ed any edited collection, um, the focus of the book was very much driven by what was submitted by contributors, three of whom we've got here today. And what I was really glad about following this call for abstracts was that chapter proposals of which there were 13, were I was able to organize these according to the what I would consider the most contentious and uh, politically topical issues in contemporary mountain bike culture. And in contextualizing the presentation, the three presentations that are going to follow today, I just wanted to share um, to share these with you and just give you a very brief explanation of what these are. So um, in no particular order, the themes that the book is uh, has been thematized according to are mountain biking identity, see these on the slide there, mountain biking bodies, mountain biking environments, and uh, the cultural politics of mountain biking. Okay, so I think as we've already established, mountain biking identities, we as a collective feel are important because they allow us to map who we are and why we do what we do fundamentally. Um, so in my experience, we, and by we I mean uh, policymakers, industry professionals, and sometimes advocacy groups, um, still seem to have a relatively poor grasp of, uh, broadly speaking, what, what the mountain biker actually is and, and what mountain biking is itself. Our sport's very much in its adolescence, but increasingly we're being asked, or in some cases forced, when we're in the outdoors, to justify our place in those spaces. And I think it's fair to say that we probably as a community need, need to make more of an effort to understand the wide ranging nature of the mountain bike community and the affiliations that that might entail. So this could include uh, the voices of coaches, uh, e-mountain bikers, enduro riders, dirt jumpers, even those nutters who kind of ride around on mountain bike unicycles that I've seen out in the Peak District National Park, which completely blows my mind. Um, and importantly, I think we've got to try and find nuanced and clever ways of, of including as many people within those conversations as we, as we can. From those that I mentioned earlier, whose affiliations with nature, for example, might involve um, the more romantic renditions of nature, right through to those whose relationships with our sport are much more based around um, emerging technologies, for example, and developments such as bike parks, e-bikes and, and trail sensors. And I think as well, you know, promoting these complex identities and affiliations will not only help us, but perhaps more importantly, that it will help others who maybe don't like us as a community, of, of whom there are many, to develop a more rounded appreciation of who we are, rather than thinking that we are all just mindless hooligans who drink energy drinks and hit 20 foot jumps and leave litter everywhere, which let's face it, we are often perceived to be. On to the second theme then, mountain biking bodies. Um, chapters in this section are oriented around what has variously been described um, as the effective or embodied qualities of mountain bike culture, which together are about, are about understanding how riders' sense of things like pleasure, risk, pain and place are felt, experienced and acted upon through participant, participants' uh, micro-level experiences of using their bikes but also using their bodies something that um, again to cite Katrina, Katrina Merving Brown she's described as the body bike hybrid and in focusing on how identities and things like symbolic meanings social expectations uh, and so on are lived out and at times counteracted by mountain bikers in those moment to moment and immediate reactions between the bike the body and the lived environment 
I think my hope is that um, we can better understand how these experiences are mapped onto the performance of certain mountain biking problems. Um, so there's a chapter, for example, by a guy called Mike Lloyd in the book who talks about crashes and how they can be, how can they, they can cause conflict sometimes on the trail. At the same time, I think they can also, in understanding bodies, furnish a better understanding of the more pleasurable aspects and positive experiences um, of mountain biking, such as the emerging demand for wild off-piste riding, for instance, and how riders might encounter specific trails according to things like fitness and confidence and, uh, and their equipment and experience and so on. So in, in talking about mountain biking environments, which is our third theme in the book, I would suggest that we need to de dedicate more attention to the relationships between social, political and economic factors on the one hand um, and ecological conditions and changes on the other. Now, there's some great work already being uh, undertaken here in, in the industry by the likes of Tom Campbell. Who I'm not sure, I think he was going to be attending today. I'm not sure if he made it. Uh, there's also some good work going on by the, the Dirt Initiative uh, in Scandinavia. Brands like Patagonia and Specialized are also getting on board with this now because uh, they're seeing there's a need to un unpack and problematize mountain biking's often contentious relationship with, with nature. Um, I've also done a little bit of work with, with Jack Black as well on this. We, we've looked at um, how trail building can sometimes elicit um, in certain instances, bonds and relationships with um, with non-humans, with dirt, with environments, with animals, with, um, with with trees and certain objects that appear in the natural environment. And what's really interesting is that I think this tells us that um, mountain bikers do care about the environment, despite what we're often told. Um, a, a, a quick anecdote um, on this would be, I spoke to a guy called Don Winter, um, uh, I did a project with Don Winter on mountain biking and climate change recently for Protect Our Winters. And he, he was telling me that mountain bikers now have actually been identified as a community of people who can um, sense climate change because they've been associated with getting more ticks on their legs in the UK when they ride. And apparently, I didn't know this, the rise in ticks in the UK has been associated with um, uh, uh, higher temperatures and, and therefore climate change, which... Yeah, it's for me that just shows you how mountain bikers do care and they, and they can provide a sense of how climate change is, is changing our world. Okay, finally, last but by name is least, I think it's there's a real need here that is addressed by this book, hopefully, um, to address what I've described as the cultural politics of mountain biking. As my example of, of, of my story of Julie at the start suggests, I think it's without a doubt that I don't dispute this, I'm sure not many people would, that we, we've got an accessibility problem in mountain biking. Um, while on the one hand, mountain biking and the culture of mountain biking attracts a multicultural body of participants from increasingly diverse geographic settings, um, it's no secret, as some of the chapters in this book um, will attest, that mountain biking still remains the preserve of affluent white middle-class men. Um, now, fortunately, there are lots of people, including Elliot Jackson here, who's pictured uh, on the slide, um, who are, are fighting against this. And I was listening to a, a downtime podcast recently, it's a mountain biking podcast with him in, where he was, um, he made that point that we can't always fall back on that idea that people can't afford mountain bikes anymore. Um, his response in the podcast was that if black people don't ride bikes because they're too expensive, then why don't we see rich black people uh, and black riders riding and the answer of course for me which I hope is addressed in, in some parts by this the, the, the fourth section of this book is is culture it's, it's a problem with culture and the exclusionary nature of mountain bike culture so on this I think while it's really important to be positive about our sport and where it's going in the future we've also got to recognize that it's got this darker side that it's all of our responsibility collectively to um, question and challenge and here, I would encourage people to think about questions such as um, what, I might, what are minority participants' experience of belonging and exclusion in mountain biking? Um, how are dominant sporting identities, practice, practices, spaces and forms of embodiment um, positioned or, or reproduced or challenged sometimes in our sport? 
And in what ways might mountain bike culture include participants from a range of different backgrounds, including those perhaps who uh, are from those least privileged um, communities of, of, of sports participants and exercisers? Okay, so um, to finish then, and, and hopefully as a lead into the, the presentations that follow, where do we go from here? Um, well, my thoughts on this are that, um, you know, we're all passionate about mountain biking. There's lots we can contribute. And existing mountain bike researchers offered some really interesting insights on various different things. The physiology of riders, the economic impact, mountain bike tourism is another one that's really taken off. But as important as this is existing evidence is, what we don't have thus far is something that conceptualizes, locates and critically examines the social, cultural and polit political significance of mountain biking in the 21st century. And I think um, there's three reasons why we need to address that. First, I think the ways in which we, we can address this. First is I think we need to foster an understanding, as, as I said, of mountain bikers' identities, activities and practices. Also looking at how they intersect with a range of local, regional and global formations. The point of which, of course, is to try and enhance existing and future political interventions that might help the mountain bike community as well as address some of these issues in more detail. Second, I think we need to develop, as per the book, I hope, um, new conceptual approaches that reflect the complex and often contradictory nature of 21st century societies. Uh, and here I'm, I'm a real advocate of, of um, exper experimental theories and, and ideas. I don't think we should be afraid to theorise because I think as a mountain bike community, we're very good at doing things. We're maybe not as good sometimes at, at thinking about how we can do those things. And, and that's becoming increasingly important. And finally, I think we need to develop as much empirical evidence as we possibly can, because one of the things that's often lacking in discussions and debates about mountain biking is that evidence to back up what it is we're saying. Um, by way of a final thought, I, I hope that this book contributes something to that effect. Um, and the whole point of it really is, is to kind of point out that despite our often um, contemptible position um, within the mainstream of uh, lands landscape of mainstream sports, I, I can, I, I do think we, we contribute something positive. Um, and I think that's this book is maybe a small but important step in trying to reinforce that uh, both in academia and in uh, and in other circles as well. OK. Um, I must admit, I've forgotten the order of, of presentations. I think it was. Was it due to be you next, Claire? You're on mute, Claire. It's down as Jacob, but you can oh, go is. whichever order you like, uh, Jim. Yeah, oh, oh, order is. Yeah, I, I sorry, uh, as I was wrapped up in my presentation, I didn't get the chance to check. But yeah, I'm happy. Jacob, if you're happy to go next, it'd be great yep. to hear from you. Okay. Thank you. Cheers, guys. All right, can everyone see that? All right, so we just wanted to say thank you to everyone, uh, both for the chance to be uh, contributors to the book, as well as to uh, share our chapter in this forum. Um, we didn't want to just repeat all of the information that we provided in the chapter for this presentation. So we tried to kind of take a little bit of a different tack in terms of thinking about how and why we arrived at this particular topic, uh, some of the findings that we had, and then some of the possible future directions uh, that hopefully our research might take us uh, in this area. So just to uh, start things off, I just wanted to show kind of what we would like to go through uh, for you today. Um, the first section that we'll get to is an introduction. So we'll both talk uh, about ourselves and kind of how we came to the project uh, just for a bit, as well as some of the previous research that we've done in this area that kind of also led us to this uh, particular path in terms of kind of theory and method. Um, we'll then get into some details in terms of that approach that we've kind of cultivated from other work uh, in our readings and then how we tried to incorporate that into this particular project. And then finally, I'll try to give some uh, detail around the analysis and findings that we provide in the chapter, uh, specifically the kind of uh, intersection of place, technology, and embodiment in relation to a particular cycling event. Uh, unlike maybe some of the other chapters not focused on mountain biking in more traditional uh, settings, but instead in an urban environment. 
Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, try to explain some of the significance both for this chapter and then how that could lead to some of the future directions that we want to go into. I'll let Oliver uh, take over for the first part of the intro. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Oliver Rick. Uh, I'm associate Pre uh, professor in uh, health and fitness studies at Regis College, which is uh, in Western Mass, just outside of Boston. Um, and yeah, so my my background and and this will be kind of maybe the 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 secret of our pairing is, is Jake's not a huge mountain biker. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen Jake on a bike full stop. Um, Guilty, <laughs> uh, but. <laughs> But I, I am, and um, my personal interest in uh, uh, in bikes brought me to doing some research broadly around uh, bikes and cycling um, for my PhD, for my dissertation, um, and this was back in 2013-14, uh, um, and was kind of broadly looking at cycling's integration into American cities at that time, as things were really uh, kind of come around again and new as to what kind of integration of bikes into cities would look like into urban environments in particular. Um, so very kind of broad, uh, but that got me going in that direction. And from there, um, I obviously being a cyclist myself, but also through that work, I was consuming a lot of media around cycling and being exposed to a lot and uh, actually came across this video and Jake came across this video around the same time we both saw uh, online um and uh, he reached out to me and was like hey have you seen this uh, uh video um and that kind of got us uh, uh working on this project in particular um that was the intersection uh bringing my cycling experience together with jake's experience uh in chile uh and with valparaiso in particular which i'll get then get to in a second um from there i've dragged jake into uh, uh some more <laughs> uh, cycling related research um but really pulling his knowledge and skills uh, with analyzing physical culture uh physical cultures within uh, urban environments um and we've been able to publish a few things off the back of that um one in particular um in a special issue of soma Technics that looked at wearable technologies that i was using um in terms of some of that research for my dissertation um, and tries to kind of build on that usage into looking at kind of urban assemblage theories and ideas uh, from there uh, that we put together. Um, so I'll hand back to Jake just to get his uh, side of, of that partnership. Yeah, so as Oliver mentioned, uh, along with his interest and in practice in mountain biking, um, I led a, a faculty-led study abroad program to Chile in 2019. Uh, most of the program was spent in Santiago, but we did spend some time in Valparaiso as well, um, a city really well known for the architecture, for being kind of a, a unique tourist destination, um, also for its street art and kind of the overall cultural feel of that particular city. Uh, one of the aspects that we were scheduled to do when we were in Valparaiso was go to the Santiago Wanderers football stadium. Um, however, that kind of fell through uh, and our tour guide had suggested that we might be able to meet with someone about, as they called it, the bike race that they'd held here. Um, and that was the kind of the extent that I knew about the particular event that we're going to show you here in a second. Um, but once I got back from that program, uh, again, I started talking with Oliver about, oh, I'd heard this thing. And then we came across uh, the Red Bull video that was produced um, and distributed by Red Bull via YouTube um, uh, from the 2015 uh, Cerro Abajo race in Valparaiso. Uh, so um, just before we get to that video, as we mentioned, both it builds on some of the specific work that we've done around Oliver's research uh, in Baltimore that was published in Soma Technics. Um, and then we also have a chapter that looked at kind of using assemblage urbanism and the particular theory that we're going to discuss here in a bit, uh, a little bit further in relation to physical cultural studies in general. Um, and that was part of the handbook of physical cultural studies that was published a few years ago. Um, so yeah, let Oliver uh, introduce the video here and then we can get to our theory and method about it and give you some idea of what we were looking at for our text. Yeah, so, so this video came around and as i said it, it kind of got passed around a lot um and and when jay kind of mentioned it and that he had been to valparaiso and, and then seen this video and and i was like yeah like i kind of heard a bit about the race here and there and kind of urban mountain biking racing and what that was um at, but i didn't know too much um and then in watching the video it it, it became uh really significant for both of us in terms of like just what was trying to be done with this type of uh, media production around this type of event. Um, and, and that piqued our interest to go a bit further. So the event's uh, been running since 2003. 
Um, but Red Bull have been a more recent kind of add on to it since the 2010s. I say recent, 2010s is not that recent anymore. It feels like that was yesterday, but um, nonetheless, um, they came on as a, as a title sponsor and started producing more uh, media around the event in the 2010s. And now they've actually moved on to having a series of these races, um, interestingly enough, across Latin America. And we'll get to kind of the specificities around uh, Latin American cities and kind of the informality of city structures in Latin America and how it lends itself to this uh, event. Um, but yeah, now it's become a, a more kind of substantial and, and regular part of a series uh, that they're doing of uh, events and then videos based off of this kind of idea of urban uh, mountain bike racing. All right, yeah, so without further ado, I'll give you at least one idea. We looked at multiple videos, obviously, for the chapter, but this was kind of the one that uh, kicked things off for us uh, with the 2015 version. Yes. Ten. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> So again, this was the uh, one of the first years that Red Bull had some of the content produced from this race. The race had started a little bit earlier, but Red Bull eventually kind of invests as a sponsor and as uh, kind of a, a main organizer of the event. And then in return, they also have uh, athletes wearing this and able to kind of, uh, capture the video and then distribute that via YouTube. Um, so in terms of how we kind of approached this particular uh, research phenomenon, uh, the idea that we wanted to study this race, uh, first off, we wanted to build, as I mentioned, on some of the previous work that we've done specifically around assemblage urbanism. Uh, and I have one of the quotes that we have often relied on here in terms of explaining that uh, on the screen. But the idea is that the city is a multiplicity. So the notion that we can 
have different forms of the city active within the same moment um, and through uh, relations between uh, technologies, bodies, and environments, again, kind of underpins how we were looking at this particular uh, research uh, act. And in order to do that, then our methods became a textual analysis of the videos that Red Bull produces, as well as the surrounding context that's provide, provided in and through those videos. So in an effort to draw out some of the relations that comprise urban downhill, the specific event that is in Valparaiso, and the representations of the event and activity via the Red Bull videos as an urban assemblage itself. Um, so this project <clears throat> tries to uh, examine urban downhill in, Valpre in Valparaiso as an assemblage of exchange between local and global practices and products involving a specific action sport culture, Red Bull as a corporate partner with a focus on digital media and wearable technology, and a particular urban environment characterized by trends in Latin American urbanization and tourism. So in terms of uh, our analysis and findings, um, two big things came to the forefront in terms of what we were looking at. Um, and the first was looking at the, the GoPro uh, footage and this idea of the GoPro gaze. I'll come back to that uh, in a little bit. Not our terminology, um, but, but one that became really useful for us. And what we were looking at, um, and you know, this is 2015, so I will say as well, like the way in which that has evolved since that point and, and kind of where we are today is, is really interesting. Um, and even the kind of like, attendant technologies around like how you even attach a GoPro uh, to your helmet or to your body right to kind of change that up and enhance come, some of the things that they're doing here is interesting as well but Red Bull have done this across a number of different sports um, this is not to say they completely have moved away from traditional sports media and that production they obviously are involved with soccer teams and Formula One teams and so on but in terms of what they put central to their broader media kind of ecosystem has been um, this production, this very much point of view production, experiential production um, of uh, sports media around what are often seen as kind of sports on the kind of peripheries, right? Um, uh, not necessarily core traditional sporting uh, uh, context. Um, and they've relied heavily on, on this type of media for a couple of things. So one, in terms of uh, uh, the experiential element, right? Um, and, and there is this kind of interesting uh, uh, juxtaposition between the kind of fairly highly produced nature of what these things actually are or what they can become, but yeah, at the same time, maintaining a feeling of raw presence uh, with the, with the uh, uh, video and the sound that they're bringing you to there. Um, you know, listening to the athletes breathing heavily and the screeches of the tires and so on, right? Um, putting that all together in a way that makes you feel like you're there in this, again, kind of like raw presence uh, of, of the moment and the experience, but it's still highly produced um, in some key ways. Um, but it also is something that can be replicated, right? Um, and something that could be shared online, right? And so these all become like kind of essential parts of what they're trying to do and, and their approach, their model. Um, obviously, a lot of uh, copycats right a lot of copycats both from kind of individuals right that kind of producer thing of getting people who are out there watching these videos also producing their own but other companies have also started to adapt and adopt this approach gopro themselves um uh exploring this as well as well as in partnership with with an organization like red bull and what they're doing with their events um so in terms of the gopro gaze we uh, had this really good quote it's a, a little longer, but I will read it because I do think it does a really good job of capturing exactly what that says. Um, so it's from Vanini and Stewart in 2017. And this is where we kind of really drew from with this GoPro gaze. Uh, so they say videos made from a, gro a GoPro gaze succeed not only in making distant and often nearly inaccessible places visible, but also in rendering them better lit, crispier, more vibrant, and more vividly saturated in color than reality itself. The physical movements therein represented appear seamless, harmonious, and even during epic episodes of failure, always fun and pleasurable. Moreover, carefully edited plots, contention is generated and dullness eliminated. The GoPro gaze is focused on the action of individuals who are adventurous, skilled, and capable of performing exciting public feats for the camera. Subjects of the GoPro gaze, in other words, are not in front of the camera for who they are in relation to the videographer and or because they happen to be there, but rather for what they are able to do and how well they do it, and therefore for their material and practical engagement with a task scape. 
So I think that really kind of captures, right? Like these are highly kind of manufactured and produced elements, but like they are intended to be very much uh, have that kind of seeming veneer of, of, of rawness of, right, of experiential kind of being there um, in a way. And I've said that rawness many times, but I do think it is a really interesting uh, dynamic of having those two things happening at the same time, right? Which is kind of essential to this kind of hyper real moment that the GoPro gaze is really allowing us to produce at, at, at a high level. Um, so quickly to move on to the kind of second big thing that we talked about, right, is why this is happening in Valparaiso and the idea of kind of DIY urbanism um, within that kind of broader idea of assemblage urbanism that we talked about. And often DIY urbanism is talked about from kind of like um, people kind of the bottom up, right? So people in uh, kind of like informal settings and sites kind of building the city in different ways. Um, I think what's really interesting this, with this, right, is looking at a giant global corporation like Red Bull engaging with ideas of um, uh, of kind of this, uh, uh, this DIY urbanism and, and how that kind of fits within what they're doing. It is not to say that Red Bull are obviously not involved in like a highly detailed and technical ma like management of this event, right? That's absolutely the case. Um, and, I, and I, in order to keep moving a little bit quickly here, I'm not going to necessarily go into some quotes that we had, but there's some great quotes we had in the chapter just talking about how how much it takes to put on an event like this, right? Um, but again, for Red Bull, in terms of the image that they're trying to produce, right, and and the kind of um, the texture to the media that they're, they're aiming for, um, it relies on this idea of embracing that DIY urbanism, right? So the, the race course is going through people's backyards, over their roofs, jumping through their living room, right? Like they want to tie into that kind of um, informality, that urban informality, the, 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 uh, the walls covered with graffiti, the, the you know, uh, broken concrete, that's the kind of thing that they're trying to tie into, while at the same time, they're involved in a highly managed uh, event experience uh, for riders and, and for people attending as well. Um, and this is why Valparaiso and Latin American cities particularly kind of lend themselves to this, right? That kind of broad idea of urban informality that is often depictive of uh, what uh, uh, Latin American cities are, this kind of idea of kind of informal urban dynamics that are going on in terms of the, the, the literal materialities of it, but the kind of interstitial, interstitial experiences and spaces that people have is layered on top of that as well. Yeah, I think just to add on, I think the other part in terms of the DIY urbanism discussion for us was that Valparaiso, and this is something that, again, from my limited experience, but was definitely noticeable, um, is a city that's obviously marked by polarities in terms of social class and poverty and wealth um, in particular. And we include a bit of this analysis in the chapter as well. But uh, it's a city that's been described as uh, opened up for pol uh, polarization in a minor spatial dimension and for fragmented structures. And it becomes a city of islands or an urban, urban archipelago. Um, and another quote kind of talks about how this relates to uh, the particular descriptions of the race. And since everyone was able to see the video, uh, one of the 2013 descriptions included the report that, quote, the start is high above the city in the favela, not the safest part of town. And the residents take security a little bit more seriously than most riders used to. Um, and then later on, that same report discusses snaking a course through the city streets or literally on top of a family's doorstep means that the team that puts on the race has to do a lot of ramp prep offsite and can't actually start putting things into place until Saturday afternoon, with many of the workers welding some features late into the night. Uh, come race day, they will have to set up, prep, and fine-tune the course and features within hours, which is no easy feat when you have uh, roughly 6,000 feet of metal riot fencing to install through busy streets and neighborhoods. Um, so this mix of structure and uh, unstructured kind of uh, ways of presenting this event, the formal and informal mix of everything from the hoardings, like you can see here from major corporations, but then also uh, fencing that has been be uh, bent sideways so that riders can go downstairs or across uh, narrow terraces. You can kind of see this, this mix becomes key for what Red Bull is trying to produce, the environment they're trying to produce, and then in turn, uh, show the relationship between that environment and the embodied experience uh, through the GoPro videos of the writers themselves. Um, so yeah, we would emphasize that it is these forms of DIY urbanism that are critical to the type of content that Red Bull seeks to uh, create through sponsoring, sponsoring action sport events and athletes like the Sarah Baja race, uh, even as it accentuates these elements through a layering of professional event management over the city every year. So in terms of significance and future directions, just to kind of reiterate and draw some of the points that we would hope uh, bring people to the wider book project and to this chapter, 
Uh, first, in terms of more macro, uh, we kind of have discussed the idea that action sports and uh, media and branding are going through kind of a, a reorganization and different types of relationships uh, in terms of the major distributors, producers, and prosumers that are involved. Um, and this obviously, in particular, in Red Bull's case, has involved niche action sport cultures, including mountain biking and maybe new iterations of it, like in the urban downhill setting, which is still relatively contemporary, especially in kind of its competitive structure. Uh, in the micro, we also would like to suggest that action sport events and uh, have particular impacts and relationships to urban environments. Uh, and specifically, not just in terms of the more broad uh, economic environments that are often kind of cited if you think about stadium construction or other ways that we kind of study sports in the city, but also at the nature uh, and ecological level. Um, and I think that that's another place that we would like to kind of uh, move forward and try to blur those lines of how we approach sports in the city and action sports in those contexts. Um, so our future directions, uh, one that we just like to kind of throw out would be some possible field work uh, also uh, with Urban Downhill, excuse me, but also um, kind of thinking about mountain biking in more of its traditional settings uh, out in rural areas. Uh, for us, that kind of has a particular uh, interest with frontier events here in the United States, uh, in the Midwest and West, that are often kind of framing cycling as a, uh, you know, another chance to experience these rugged and untamed landscapes. Um, and you often hear this in kind of how the events themselves are branded and uh, experienced in the ways that they try to sell themselves. Um, so yeah, uh, with that, just want to, again, say thank you to everyone and we uh, really welcome any questions. Appreciate it. Thank you, Olive, Oliver, Oliver and Jacob. Um, I think we're gonna to lead to the, quest the questions to the ends. Uh, Certainly. Rather than doing it now, um, it's just in the interest of time. But uh, I must say, I think I've read that chapter a total of about 65 times now. And <laughs> every time I read it or hear about it, something new pops out that, um, kind of spurs my imagination or gets me thinking about mountain biking in a different way. So thank you very much for that. Um, you, without further ado, then we will move on to Claire, who I believe is next. And what's nice about this, almost by design, is that we're now moving from the urban, the urban over to the natural. So over to you, Claire. Okay, great. I'll just share my screen. Let's hope. You can all see this um, slideshow play from start. Okay, is this full screen for everyone? Great. Hey, good evening, everyone. I hope you're all looking forward to Christmas break, which isn't too long away. We're crawling to the finish line if you're in academia. Um, firstly, I'd just like to say thanks to Jim for inviting me to present. And what I'm going to do is just go through my chapter as briefly and succinctly as possible, but give you an idea about what I've written about and how it links to my PhD research. So I'm currently a PhD researcher at Leeds Beckett University. Um, I'm a performance artist. I'm also a cyclist and um, I'm writing about air pollution. So my chapter uh, title is Air Pollution as Slow Violence During Multi-Day Mountain Bike Trips. And what I'm going to uncover in this presentation is how mountain biking can be a performative art methodology to investigate, reveal and disseminate the problems of air pollution. So I've got a shot there of my bike with lots of equipment attached to it, which I'll explain in a second. So throughout this chapter, I consider air pollution as a form of slow violence, a term which is coined by environmental scholar Rob Nixon to reference a gradual out of sight violence that occurs over years and even decades. As a default mentality, we tend to associate violence in conjunction with the dictionary definition. So as a behavior involving physical force intended to hurt or kill something or someone. It's therefore an inherently visible act, which is emotional, it's fast, and it's executed often with brutality and force, not as Nixon describes as an event that happens over a long period of time, often going unnoticed. So by adopting the term slow violence when referring to air pollution, that's what's really interesting for me. And it may allow a reframing of air pollution for what it really is. So an invisible element that pervades every aspect of our lives. So to further give context, I just need to move you all out the way of my slide. Nixon also attributes slow violence to environmental concerns such as the destruction of oceans and coral reefs, deforestation and climate change. 
It's not typically viewed as violence because it is a delayed destruction that is dispersed across time and space. Okay. So in August uh, 2018, it feels like a very long time ago now, but it also feels like yesterday. I experienced firsthand how such air pollution can affect one's experience of cycling in off-road environments as I cycled parts of the world for 12 months on a bomb track beyond plus one bicycle. There she is. She's called Brittany Gears. During this trip, I pedaled through Norway. That's the picture in Norway there. Germany, Spain, Nepal, South Australia, Tasmania and New Zealand. And I carried everything I needed with me on the bike. So my tent, my cooking equipment, um, two pairs of everything, uh, wear one, wash one. Um, lots of water, a water filter, because I had to usually get water out of rivers and it didn't look very clean. Um, but one of the countries we cycled through that I mentioned is Nepal. So the air quality in Kathmandu was monitored via a mobile app at the time called Air Visual, and an air pollution mask was worn daily for health and well-being. The poor visibility became a daily challenge with thick orange dust repeatedly churned up with every vehicle and motorcycle wheel. It was hazardous dust that blanketed the bicycle's components, the body, it stained my clothing, it layered on my hair, it seeped into my skin, it was in my ears, it irritated the eyes, nostrils and thickened on the surgical mask that I was wearing daily. So as you can see, it's chaos. Um, this is in the lowlands. So within a short space of time, the mask uh, was coated with layers of visible pollution and other unknown environmental matter to the point where I basically stopped wearing one. And I don't know if you've all cycled with a mask um, on in heat, it's very difficult to get your breath. Um, so to provide further context, the particulate matter PM 2.5 concentration, we'll ex I'll explain a little bit more uh, as we go on, in Kathmandu at this time of speaking is 7.4 times the World Health Organization guideline value. So undoubtedly, I mean, you can see how foggy and dusty it is. This is midday cycling um, in the lowlands of Nepal. This is one of the key reasons why around 100 people die every day in Nepal due to air pollution. So the figures are huge uh, and really obviously very shocking. So moving from Nepal, one of the um, dirtiest cities in the world for air pollution to the north of Tasmania, which is what you see here, um, introduced me to the Tarkine Forest. And the Tarkine Forest has been inscribed on the National Heritage List and has topped data charts for the cleanest air readings in the world, as measured by the nearby United Nations monitoring station, the Cape Grim Station. So I went in a very short distance, I went from the most polluted city in the world to the cleanest city, cleanest location in the world, which was quite, the disparity was a little bit confusing. But despite clean air statistics in um, Tasmania, we were still plagued by bushfires, which obviously meant that air pollution levels were astronomically high and dangerous for health. So we still couldn't get away from air pollution, despite being in the cleanest location. So after a year of pedaling, I came back home, sadly, I ran out of money. Um, and... I started looking at um, air pollution in the UK, so issues to do with air pollution in the UK, and if we had the same issue here back at home. So across the world, millions of premature deaths per year are associated with air pollution. A recent study by the Francis Crick Institute in London suggests that one in 10 lung cancer patients in the UK is due to the exposure of dirty air. And it's estimated that twice as many people today suffer from lung disease and asthmatic conditions caused by air pollution than they did 20 years ago. Researchers have now made significant steps linking air pollution with ne early neurological decline and disease. So Beth Gardner, who is an air pollution journalist, has stated that the danger posed by air pollution is slow moving and far from obvious, which links nicely to Rob Nixon's quote of slow violence, air pollution being framed as slow violence. The invisibility of air pollution therefore suggests that it can be easily overlooked and remains low on the public's priority list. So as you can see here, these articles taken from BBC News around the time of my return. 
and over the last um, few years. So air pollution likely cause of up to 6 million premature births. We can smell and taste the traffic at school, which is what I'm kind of getting interested in, in terms of my embodied research. And then air pollution, even worse than we thought. And a couple of quotes here, one from Friends of the Earth. Across the UK, there are nearly 2,000 locations over air quality limits, leaving millions of us breathing dangerously polluted air. And globally, 19,000 people die each day from pollution, killing more than HIV and AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and car accidents combined. And that's from author Tim Smedley in 2019. Okay. So upon returning home, um, I started collecting abundance of data, and this is around the time of lockdown. So we got our hourly exercise, um, which was good because I'd go out on daily exercise, uh, riding my bike, collecting data. And uh, I cycled coast to coast. So if you're not from the UK, it's basically cycling from the West Coast to the East Coast or vice versa. And I did it from Morecambe uh, to Bridlington in the East Riding of Yorkshire. And basically, I took with me a Flow 2 sensor, which is this little sensor here, manufactured in Paris. And it connects to your iPhone, and it basically gives you live readings of five pollutants. So every time that the readings were moderate or higher, I'd mark a little black dot on the map of where I was. Um, and over the course of a three-day arts performance, I collected 85 moderate or higher levels of air pollution. The sensor was strapped to the handlebars um, and it measures volatile organic compounds, vox, particulate matter, 10, 2.5 and 1, and nitrogen dioxide. So these 85 points from left to right, um, these were recorded on gravel paths, traffic free paths, single tracks, country lanes, as well as when passing through towns and villages. Now, this goes through some quite big cities. Um, York, where I live, being one of them, which is obviously heavily polluted, but the highest level of PM10 was recorded here at this point, um, which is a location surrounded by fields in the Yorkshire Dales, which was obviously really shocking. Uh, it calls attention to air pollution that is captured in more natural wild and supposedly pristine environments, which is in many ways more problematic at the ethical, ontological, ontological and epistemological level. So when I got um, the data from this, I began to work with atmospheric scientist, Dr. Daniel Bryan at the Wolfson Atmospheric Chemistry Laboratories at the University of York. And he um, has kindly, we've collaborated for the last three years um, and he deciphers all the data and analyzes all the data that I collect during bicycle rides. So he's um, analyzed masks that I've worn during bicycle rides, um, which has revealed that the body actually is so intertwined with the environment um, that we can't separate the two. So within the data found on this surgical mask that I wore, this HEPA filter mask during the performance ride, actually sun cream, makeup, sweat, all of the body's kind of leakages were just as prominent as the environmental matter that it collected on it as well. So this proves that in when you go into the labs and you wear um, scientific coats and goggles and you try to limit the, um, the body from the collection and the testing process, what I believe is that we're actually very difficult to separate the body from its environment. So these are just some collection swabs that I take. I usually take sellotape samples after rides. And on the right-hand side, that is what I call smog swatches, which are sm uh, swatches of the sky taken through the 85 points of pollution. And these all create different forms of artworks for me, um, as well as artist books. So um, this artist book of Coast to Coast on the left-hand side, all of the data that you see there is actually leakages from the body found within the mask rather than the environment. Um, and yeah, I've kind of used a dust jacket, GF Smith paper cover there to kind of elevate the pollution and environmental matter within the book. Okay, it's just one of, one of many things that have been created. Likewise, I'm doing a lot of olfactory experiments 
Um, so trying to get people to smell filters and seeing what kind of pollution it might be or what kind of source it might be from. And also encouraging people to write pollution diaries as well as myself. So that newspaper article of the school kids on BBC News saying, um, I can smell it and I can taste it outside of my school. That's what I'm really interested in, in terms of my research. It's the embodied aspect of pollution. So um, I work with a lot of citizen scientists and they do pollution rides for me and I get them to write in a pollution diary um, of where they smelt it and how it tastes. Um, yeah, to tap into the embodied aspects. So I also collected data using a flow two sensor, a mini Voltas sampler, and through the method of attunement. Um, this is at Dolby Forest, which is in North York Moors National Park. And there's an array here of cycle trails to tackle, ranging from leisurely and flat, which are labeled as green routes, to highly technical and demanding routes, which are labeled as blue, red, or black. Um, so we're talking about the aspect and method, the embodied method of attunement here. Um, so when mountain biking, and in this case in the forest, the senses become heightened. The human body maneuvers in collaboration with the bicycle and the terrain. Our heightened state of awareness can unlock effective encounters with our surroundings, which allows for a deeper attunement with our environment. The smells of pine, soil, wet tree trunks, moss, smoky scents were all present during the rides. We have to acknowledge that it's a, a visceral, it's an embodied and it's a sensorial experience. So Brittany Gear has got a bit of a makeover, um, sprayed, sprayed the bike white to be able to visually see environmental matter more. Um, and this is a mini Voltas sampler that I'm talking about, which basically acts as a giant hoover. It sucks the air in from the surroundings and it collects all of the air pollution data onto a quartz filter. OK, so I start, I've started riding with that over the last couple of years. So the highest average recordings during the performance rides were in Dolby Forest were uh, volatile organic compounds 21, which is classed as moderate. PM10 particulate matter 139, which are classed as very high, PM2.5 34, which is moderate, PM120, which is low, and NO2 11, which is low. When analysing the data more rigorously, an average of 18 locations across a 15 kilometre route detected very high levels of PM10. And to give you a bit of context, PMs are produced from a range of primary and secondary sources with different sources dominating different size ranges. So they say that PM10 is the tenth of a width of a human hair. And that's why it's so dangerous, because it seeps into our um, blood vessels and, and can go to lung, our lungs and brain. Larger particles such as PM10 are usually comprised of primary inorganic species originating from combustion processes, construction and road transport, as well as natural sources such as sand and sea salt. So these are the quartz filters that we analyze and that gray ring in the middle there, all of that is the pollution that's being collected. So they all start off white to begin with. So to wrap this up, um, importantly, this chapter considers necessary quantitative data collection, but also how the body itself can be seen as a crucial site of knowledge production. And as Carl Villo states here, toxicity can be sensed outside of quantitative data and technological devices. She considers that human body's attunement to the air allows us to access different regimes of perceptibility from bodily symptoms and sensitivities to intimate interactions. By adopting embodied contemplation of our entanglements with others, such as air pollution particles and environmental matter, it allows us to acknowledge on a deeper level the agency between body and matter, which highlights that air pollution is a form of slow violence. This is why arts practice and interdisciplinary collaboration are fundamental in the mountain biking community. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Claire. Um, the, the child in me loves that you've, that you've named your bike Brittany Gears. Um, I just think that's fantastic. The academic in me hates you because 
Having spent years myself trying to establish that connection between mountain bikers and the environment and trying to figure out how mountain bikers might contribute to uh, an approach that suggests that they might be able to sense the environment, we've got someone here who's come along and did it vastly better than I ever could. So um, thank you so much for that. Um, okay, last but by no means least, we've got Jeff. And also what's nice about the order of these is that Jeff... Having had a presentation now about the urban and a presentation about the natural, I believe Jeff's going to tell us about how mountain biking can be located somewhere in between. Let's see. Okay, great. Am I, uh, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see you. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Yeah, and let, let me know if, uh, let me know if for some reason you don't see the slides or the videos and all. Make, I'll get it working. So thank, thank you um, to um, Jim for pulling together this volume. And it's been great to hear from uh, presenters uh, and look forward to the publication of, of this book. So uh, I'm Jeff Warren. I am currently serve as uh, Dean of Liberal Arts at Yorkville University uh, in the Vancouver area. Uh, I've done this chapter with John Retresco, and John would love to be here today, but quite fittingly, he's on a several week bike traverse. Uh, last I connected with him, he was in northern Spain, but he was talking about going somewhere uh, warmer next, so I'm not quite sure where he is right now. All right, um, to, just to start, I wanted to uh, acknowledge that uh, that much of this work took place on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Squamish peoples. And John, I've been grateful to have the opportunity to work, learn, and live in this blessed territory. We started this project when we were both working at Quest University in Squamish, British Columbia, which is between Vancouver and Whistler. Uh, John's a sociologist uh, who has worked on topics including health, my expertise is in music and philosophy, and especially in the combination between music and ethics. We started this work on a bike ride when we were trying to escape work. Um, we're both in the woods a lot, and John's a better rider than me, so we're not always on the, in the same program. Uh, but on this ride, uh, our, our conversation turned to the increasing number of mountain biking films featuring Squamish and also about how the mountain biking community thinks about riding on unceded indigenous territory. We're especially interested in the ways that films both tried to reflect and at the same time influenced riding experiences. In other words, we're interested in how films and riding are co-constitutive of each other. So we started this work. I spent time analyzing musical multimedia and John started doing interviews with local riders. We both got involved in local mountain bike group gatherings to hear their experiences and also to share early findings with local and provincial level mountain biking tourism advocates. Um, this has been a quite in intentionally interdisciplinary project, and this is highlighted by the outputs we have in this project so far. I did an, uh, an interview on pink bike. Um, we, uh, our first article was uh, on white settler Canadian understandings of mountain biking, indigeneity, and recreational colonialism. We also did a chapter um, on, uh, on a book on Heidegger and music that, that I co-edited. So we're not sure where this research will go next, but we're pleased to share some of what we wrote about uh, in, in this chapter. So I'm going to start by reading our introduction, just so you can see the scope of the chapter. Won't be able to, of course, talk about all the chapter, but just want to give you an idea of, of what this is. So constructions of authenticity are both complementary and conflicting, and traces of these conflicts remain in cinematic representations of mountain biking. One common idea is that authenticity is being yourself in the moment when you're in control and connecting to the world around you. Alternatively, being yourself can be linked to innovation. It's what you do that differentiates yourself from others. Yet authenticity can also be outward rather than inward looking, equating authenticity with meeting an ideal established by the past or by a culture. So in this chapter, our big questions are, how are the historical trajectories of these ideals of authenticity and the socio-political conditions that frame them, how do they inform contemporary mountain biking media? And what can this media tell us about mountain bikers and the broader contemporary mountain biking sportscape? 
We investigate these questions through an examination of two exemplars of mountain biking multi multimedia as participating both in the history of uh, the ideas and some contemporary social discourses of authenticity and power. Our examination of excerpts uh, from two mountain biking films demonstrates how these constructions of authenticity are employed in multi-layered ways. First, they construct and communicate ideals of authenticity. And second, they mobilize configurations of power in ways that make the specific appear universal, thus reproducing gendered, racial, and colonial inequalities. So these films don't just reflect mountain biking experiences, but are co-constitutive of experiences in ways that both solidify and perpetuate particular constellations of authenticity and also re reproduce sociocultural situated forms of inequality. So I won't be able to, like all the presenters, won't be able to dive into all of what we talk about in the chapter, but what I'll try to do is I'll frame these three ideas of authenticity and then show part of how we applied them to a couple of mountain biking films. Um, so the first, uh, the first ideal of authenticity is being yourself. This uh, being yourself is an idea indebted to the redefinition of human nature in the Romantic era. This is a, an idea of kind of becoming who you are or being a true self. Um, this idea came up and also was linked with ideas of nature and the relations of human and nature and being yourself within the natural world. This is something we see in developments in artistic practice. For example, in developments of the Rukin figure, a faceless figure portrayed in a way where we imagine we might be that figure. This, this visual makes its way into mountain biking. And even to my surprise, when I opened my benefits, my extended health benefits on the front page of that. Um, so there's a couple issues uh, with this view, including uh, examining who is uh, in the position to be allowed to explore what being themselves means and the ways that these romantic ideals of nature are entangled in colonial constructions of nature as a space ready to be controlled and dominated. Uh, here, uh, the Charles Taylor's book, The Ethics of Authenticity, discusses the origin and issues with the ideals, these ideals, and Simon Feldman's book, Against Authenticity, Why You Shouldn't Be Yourself, is interesting on this idea of authenticity as well. A second concept of authenticity is living up to some sort of uh, ideal established by the past or by the culture. Here we might look at common ways where we, we might talk about authentic cuisine, or we might look at the early music movement that argued that playing uh, 18th century music authentically by using instruments for that period, or even looking at the campaign for real ale. Uh, here, authentic in these cases means that it's in some way or another the real deal. We see this in mountain biking too. So in early mountain biking films, such as the Cranked series, we, we see that affiliations with groups of riders or adherence to a particular right, uh, lifestyle was the marker of authenticity in the sense of belonging or living up to an ideal. Yet another idea, uh, and our third ideal of authenticity is thinking about authenticity as innovation. So being yourself here means not copying others, but instead making something new and unique. Again, I'll use a musical example. Um, think of a common argument somebody might make for liking music. They would say, I like this music artist or this artist is authentic because they write their own music. Here we have this idea of the, of the authentic as this innovator, this uh, genius or godlike creator able to create something from nothing. These are ideas that Immanuel Kant talked about and continued through the romantic, romantic era thinkers. In mountain biking media, we see authenticity as originality and creation is most often associated with technical prowess, skill, and the assumption of risk that informs performing ever more difficult technical feats on the bike. So what we're interested in here is how these ideals of authenticity manifest in mountain biking films. Following multimedia scholars, we argue that these films both reflect mountain biking experiences and influence how people experience or think about their own mountain biking. In other words, escaping to, to, on a bike to find oneself involves more than just oneself and a bike and necessitates the act of enrollment or other, of other objects and media. 
And so let's turn to some films to see to see uh, how we might begin looking at and identifying this in films. So a visually stunning film with excellent as a visu visually stunning film with excellent writing and a custom soundtrack. In many respects, the 2010 film Life Cycles raised the bar for mountain biking films. It used the now common form of establishing a framing idea, followed by shorter second segments of riding featuring different riders and terrains. So in this film, uh, the, the framing device is a vo voiceover invoking the narrator's granddad and talking about the metaphor of the river and the in, in, uh, that it's inevitable that we're moving forward. Uh, then we move to the visuals that start at a factory. We learn that this factory is making mountain bikes. Next, we see one of these bikes that are manufactured loaded into a truck navigating uh, first in, down, down Vancouver's, uh, Vancouver's downtown east side, which is the city's most significant concentration of material deprivation and human suffering. In this case, the film suggests that we find our true authentic selves by escaping the, uh, the alienation of uh, urban decay. The film continues uh, by following an unmarked white male body in an authentically vintage orange truck through the dystopian urban environment and then across the Lionsgate Bridge to North Vancouver, the birthplace of local mountain biking. The space here is suddenly filled with trees and birdsong and rain infiltrate what was the menacing industrial music, um, which, uh, so even though North Vancouver is thoroughly um, an anthropocentric urban environment, we see nature and hear rain, invoking the fantasy of a sublime authentic landscape undisturbed by human activity. And it's in this act of escape that functions, seems to function as the precondition of an authentic self-expression uh, in, the, in the scenes that follow, which are uh, riding scenes through North Vancouver. This, the film then goes through a bunch of different riding locations. And later in the film, there's a segment film that's in the Canadian prairies. Um, here, the meditation on the relationship between mountain bikers and land is developed through the metaphors of farming, whiteness, and settler colonialism. And I'll play a bit of this, uh, a bit of this film. Granddad was all about those connections. He had his hands in the earth as much as he did machines. Maybe that's why he understood both sides. Sure, we till and cut, we reap and we sow. And yeah, we do great damage. But we're also capable of great good. After all, no matter how smart we think we are, we're just another part of the mystery. Balance a bike right. Keep the pedals turning. Forget about everything except right now. And there's no place you can't ride. That's what Granddad used to say. So this choice to film a jump scene in the wheat fields of Saskatchewan invokes two of our framings of authenticity. First, this represents innovation, doing something no one had done before on film, which is that hallmark of innovation as authenticity. Second, it seems to raise these imagined cultural ideals. In this case, the, the salt of the earth, hardworking farmer. It's punctuated here by music from a bluesy guitar to invoke nostalgia and authenticity a culturally appropriated reference uh, to days gone by before shifting to this energetic music when the writing begins. So to be clear, we're not under the impression that the creators of life cycles um, purposely uh, deploy these manifestations of inequality in their film. On the contrary, these subtle presences are worthy of examination precisely because they're un unconsciously deployed in this quest to present authenticity in sportscapes. 
And so life cycles uh, succeed in it, succeeds in its quest for authenticity, but here we ask what other messages it sends uh, in doing so. It seems to show that in this film, authenticity is possible or achievable, um, but only when built on the foundation um, of, settle, uh, of views of settler colonialism and escape from urbanism. Our critique here is not intended as a condemnation of the film, but as an invitation to inquiry about uh, where we invert a line that we hear elsewhere from the folksy na narrator who says, we're capable of great good, but are also great, capable of great damage. And so we ask, does it need to be that way? And in what ways can, uh, can mountain biking films and media help construct um, uh, the, the sort of environment we'd like to see? Next, I'm gonna uh, go to a segment from the film Unreal that has been called, uh, this is a 2015 film, um, that's been called by one filmmaker, possibly the greatest, the single greatest video segment of all time. Uh, this three and a half minute clip uh, opens uh, with, uh, with the title, Get Lost in the Moment. As in life cycles, it begins with the rider driving a vintage GMC truck to the start of a trail. And it's shot in one take, it traces the rider Brandon Seminuk riding through a custom built jump trail cut into a grassy hillside and features a change from a dirt jumper to a mountain bike. So I'll play a, a piece of this film. Something happening here What it is ain't exactly clear There's a man with a gun over there Telling me I got to beware I think it's time we stop Children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down stop the sound and we'll keep that playing in the background. Here we see that the music here is Buffalo Springfield's 1966 song, For What It's Worth. And this seems to contrast with what a lot of the high energy music that's typical in thrill-seeking sport films, where the music either tries to communicate the adrenaline of the rider or tries to induce that adrenaline in the viewer. The lyrics, uh, the lyrics referencing the 1966 riots on the Sunset Tri Strip or the popular reception of this song as a protest song don't relate to the action in the film. Instead, the music seems to facilitate escape, um, so spe specifically the escape to an imagined nostalgia. Escape forms the meta uh, meta narrative of the film Unreal. Between writing segments are hyperbolized portrayals of modern life, work, and stress. And these regular life uh, and these images of regular life are portrayed as part of living a life that's not real. Life and like in life cycles, um, it's suggested that it's only through escaping the everyday that we can have experiences that are truly authentic. 
The argument that the mostly unbuilt environment provides an escape to nullify the effects of society draws from the same ground from this, some of these 19th century ideas that birthed the ideas of authenticity. So for example, the uh, 19, a late 19th century German organization made the claim that hiking in the mountains was a chance to revitalize and de-energize the neglected and overstressed bodies of modern ur urban people. It's almost exactly what we're seeing in these films, the same ideas. It also uh, matches Nietzsche's ideas that something happens al along your hike up the mountain and that uh, while you're hiking up a mountain, uh, you have a chance to become who you are. So if escaping the everyday is necessary, the next question is where that escape leads. This film describes escape in its tagline as into the adventurous, thrill-seeking world of mountain biking. But in this segment, it also seems to conjure escape into a nostalgia of an imagined past. Sonically, the outer world is escaped. The mundane of everyday life fades out. The soundtrack evokes an experience we, we recognize, so we hear all the environmental sounds, and once the music uh, starts, uh, it cuts out all those environmental sounds, and we just hear the music like we would through our headphones. And so this invokes the history of individual listening uh, that was championed again in the concert halls in the 19th century. And these were again part of uh, forming some of these uh, ideals of, of authenticity. That's, a, that's a deep, something we could talk about another time. Something else interesting here is that one online co commentator notes that the landscape looks like the ubiquitous Windows XP default desktop image. And so there's this interesting cycle of reinforcement of images and the ideals of authenticity. Microsoft selects a landscape already considered beautiful and at the, at the same time reframing that landscape into the, one of the most reproduced images in history, in recent history. We view the escape into an imagined past of pristine but familiar la landscapes uh, and lack of digital media uh, and often repeated music behind our screens, willingly forgetting, if only, uh, if only for a moment, all that's necessary for us to be viewing the technological mediation, the complexities of riding um, uh, these, these bikes, these machines through trails that take hundreds of hours to build on land that's only there as a result of indigenous dispossession and settler colonialism and our wider social responsibilities. So, um, so as we wrap, wrap this up, there's a, there's a quote about music that I think is just as applicable to mountain biking as it is of music. Um, so this is a quote from, uh, from Nicholas Cook, and I'm going to replace music with mountain biking as I read it. That the values wrapped up in the idea of authenticity are not simply there in mountain biking. They're there because the way we think about mountain biking put them there. And of course, the way we think about mountain biking affects the ways that we mountain bike. And so the process becomes circular. So our criticisms of these ideals and films should not be considered as a reason to stop mountain biking, but rather that a call for mountain bikers to critically rethink the ideals of authenticity that surround their practice and strive to understand one's, one's place within political and societal constructs, as well as to think of the ethical implications of our actions when, our, when we're on our bike. In our other research, something we looked at in our, in our interviews, a theme that came out is that people thought when they were biking, they were escaping politics. They were escaping responsibilities. They were just, it was just them and their bike. And we're calling instead for us to think about, really think about what our responsibilities are when we're on our bike. So we believe that notions of authenticity can be rehabilitated um, through being co-joined co with responsibility. Instead of escaping into, imagined his, an, into an imagined history, escaping to find yourself or escaping to connect with a landscape disassociated with the weight of history, we ask what a reconfigured aesthetic, an experience of responsible authenticity might involve, as there's no way that we can escape from responsibilities that we have to one another. Um, a sense of self isn't just found in authenticity, but in responding to those around us. Uh, we can't escape the past and other people. 
Mountain biking has immeasurably enriched the lives of both of the authors of this chapter and many of you uh, who, are, who, are, who are joining this today. And we encourage, uh, and, and in the chapter, we encourage our readers um, to, and ourselves to ask how a morally and ethically responsible framing of authenticity might change both the ways that we think about mountain biking and the ways that we make and consume uh, mountain biking multimedia. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, and, and thank you to John in his absence. Um, uh, although I'm sure he's having a great time out there in Spain, and I'm not jealous at all. Um, as ever, as with any great piece of writing, Jeff, what you've done there is you've managed to um, get me to reflect and reevaluate my um, my reading of both of those films um, when they were first released, and this is we're going way back now, aren't we? With uh, life cycles, I hated life cycles, but I loved. Um, I loved Unreal. And now I've, I've, I've definitely, having read your chapter and been introduced to your work, got mixed emotions about both. So um, if, it, if you've achieved anything, it's convincing me to, 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 go, to go back and watch those films and think about them in a different way. Um, okay, so we've got uh, a healthy amount of time for questions. I think Luke said that um, we could go up to half past nine with this, which is great. So we've got 45-ish minutes. Um, I've got lots of questions, but I know the book inside out, so I will open the floor to other people to, to pose those questions as well. And as ever, they, these can go in the chat or they can go uh, or they can be um, verbalized on camera. Okay, um, while well, other people might be mulling over what they might ask, um, I've got one for you, Claire. One of the most interesting aspects of your chapter that we've discussed at length via email is, is your revelation that the highest pollution reading was in the, the countryside. Um, I'm just wondering, as somebody because I work for an advocacy group as well called Peak District 10CB, and we spend most of our time trying to defend the presence of mountain bikes because of the uh, assumption that, that they are, or the perception that they are artificial and therefore more polluting in, in various ways. I wonder, do you think you're finding that the artificial is present in the natural or the organic could help mountain bikers to maybe defend themselves a little bit better? <laughs> yeah, potentially. Um, so the thing is, is everybody asks me, you know, what is the source of that pollution? Why is it so high in that specific area? And obviously it's really tricky to answer it because having worked with atmospheric chemists over the last few years, um, you cannot strictly define what that source is or where it's come from. So what we're, what we're kind of, um, finding out which is quite frustrating is that um if you cycle down a, a single track you know at a certain time on a certain day during a certain type of weather if it's windy if it's not windy if it's raining if it's not raining you're going to get different levels of pollution it's so um the factors of it are so determined by obviously what's going on at that point in time and it can be affected by the weather and, you know, what season it is. Um, if there's someone with a diesel engine on somewhere, if someone's burning a log burner. Um, I mean, we've thought about that that point in the Yorkshire Dales with beautiful vistas completely surrounded by fields and thought, how have we got a really high level of pollution here? Um, and we think it might be from a log burner from a farmhouse, but that's as, as far as we've got. Um, but scientists cannot be, you know, very decisive or accurate on where it, where the source is. Um, so I guess that's the battle that we're trying to to face in terms of what you mentioned about, you know, the artificial in the natural. Um, people want to know what what it is, what's the source of it, and it's very hard to determine. Yeah, it's what's so also um, what's also funny about that is the the most abuse we get 
from landowners is from farmers. <laughs> so uh, I hope at some point you can prove that all of that smog has come from that one farmer's uh, potentially. Chimney, that would be tremendous. Pesticides, you know, everything that's used, vegetation, it all creates it all creates particulate matter. So it's yeah, and vox, it's it's everywhere. We're intertwined and, with it, unfortunately. And I guess this is the point is that which all three of the chapters do a great job of elucidating, which is that people uh, take umbrage to mountain biking because they see it as disrupting the natural balance of that environment. Whereas really, I think what all three of these chapters have, have proven is that nature was already compromised when we got there. Yeah. And all of you know, the, the, the information that you've given us today, all three of you has, has kind of um, has, has given us a, a, a way of justifying that, which is great. Are there any are there any other questions other than mine? I, I I'll make a, a comment that can lead you know, lead to a question. Something that uh, Jim you mentioned in your in in your presentation, and I think is highlighted by the differences of the mountain biking that we talked about in each of these presentations, was that mountain biking isn't this one thing, and oftentimes. Uh, it's not just mountain bikers versus non-mountain bikers. Within mountain biking, there are these subcultures that might say, oh, the, the bike packing, the, the mountain biking Claire is talking about, that's not real mountain biking, or it's or this idea of these conflicting subcultures that are partially informed by these subcultures, but are also reinforced by the media that are also enforced by the ways that bike companies themselves make different categories of bikes and sell them to a particular type of, of, of rider. I'm just wondering how, uh, Jim, you probably have to deal with this more than the rest of us uh, trying to put this book together, but in what ways can we think about talking about mountain biking as one thing, but knowing that it's lots of things and often quite conflicting. Um, and so maybe that's a question for you, but also for any of the presenters is how do you do the work of both frame of saying I'm dealing with mountain biking, but then framing the type of mountain biking that you're working with for that particular piece of writing. That's a great question, Jeff. Um, and I'm sure other people might have some thoughts on this as well, but in terms of how the, the book came together and what I think about the culture of mountain biking what I would say is um, my colleague Jack who's who's on the call uh, will probably say I'm getting this all wrong now but the, the more Jack and I have worked together the more I've become fond of um, uh, Slavoj Žižek's work um, and one of the useful concepts that Žižek provides us with that I've uh, introduce readers to in the introduction is this idea of the concrete universal and um, my interpretation of that is that you can kind of have similarities and differences to put it to put it simply coexisting at the same time that's okay um, because our differences are what make us human uh, and, and that just for me that works really well in mountain biking because you can have the, the difference between us you know, there are umpteen different disciplines in mountain biking now, ranging from enduro right over to, you know, the kind of stuff Claire's doing. And we can all be very different. And in some cases, we can actually not get on. Um, you know, I, I I have a lot of beef with e-mountain bikers sometimes, although having I have friends who are electric mountain bikers. I'm sure a lot of people dislike the, the riding styles that I engage in, which are predominantly kind of enduro and gravity-based. But sometimes it's those differences that, that can bring us together. And, and I think those antagonisms are really important because if you look at the things that we have, although we have all these differences, there are certain things, i.e. the content and the, the way the book has, has been thematized that bring us together through those differences. And they would be things like, if you look at the presentations we've had today, for example, we've had discussions around colonialism, both in your presentation there, Jeff, and in, in Jacob and, um, and Oliver's to a certain extent. We've had discussion around the use of space. Um, you know, if we're talking about the urban or the natural, we can have a conversation about pollution and climate change. So in some, 
And to answer your question directly, I think it's the antagonisms that, that maintain our community. And we shouldn't be afraid to explore those because they are the very things that gives, give us our foundation. Just to kind of add to that, I think um, in my thesis, currently I'm writing my thesis, hence why I look like a zombie, uh, the baggy eyes. Um, in my thesis, I've had to kind of define the difference between a performative bicycle ride uh, under the framework of performance art and a leisurely bicycle ride. Um, you know, when I've been discussing about all of my data collection being, a perf it's under the, the framework of performance art, people say, well, what's the difference between that and a leisurely bicycle ride? And I would argue that a leisurely bicycle ride is something you go on and enjoy and you're not really thinking about where you're going or what you're doing. Whereas with my performative rides, they're like a premeditated event that I like knowingly put on to be able to achieve and collect something. Um, so you're in the framework and mindset of attuning and unlocking those registers of perceptibility to the environment. You're unlocking those kind of the notion of attunement to the environment on a deeper level. Um, and that to me is potentially the difference with performative art as bicycle riding and leisurely bicycle riding, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'd like to jump in there and try and build a, a strange bridge, um, a, a strange bridge towards the other three um, sessions, which I appreciate most people in the audience haven't been to, but just trust me on this. So um, the sessions uh, spanning across the four events have all been about exploring um, as a practice without making grand claims and, and, and trying to be very inclusive about how we how we view those those things. So what are different degrees of intensity uh, of, of, of that exploring um, within each mode? Um, and where I'm trying to grapple towards a question, and it may not emerge as a question, but I'm gonna have to try and turn it into a question, uh, is, so we thought about urban explorers in our first session, We've thought about uh, people who go underground, uh, be they potholers, spelunkers, or, 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 or whatever. Uh, and we've thought about, what was the last one? Someone remind me what the last one was about. Uh, that's embarrassing. Uh, rock climbing. Rock climbing, that's it, right, okay. So um, I'm trying to think, because what's really struck me is I'm not a biker, um, I'm a sort of walker. I'm not an antagonistic walker who's, who necessarily sort of snarls at bikes when I go past. But, uh, but oh, God, my chosen yeah. my chosen mode is 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 is, is foot power, um, and I'm thinking about mountain biking in the context of this series of four events as the most technologically dependent. There's there's a there's a an insertion into the experience of exploring which is that you are not directly climbing into the ruin or the hole in the ground or the rock face. You're climbing onto a bike and having certain sensations, experiences and positioning of, of, of gaze. Um, and so how much, is, is there a double exploration going on? Are you exploring the climbing onto a machine as well as exploring the being out somewhere? And, and, and does it matter that there's that doubling going on? Uh, I don't know if that question makes any sense whatsoever, but it just strikes me there's a there's a metal elephant in the room um, that needs unpacking. But then just before I leave that as a sort of question, what then occurred to me is, yes, but there are machines in those other practices. Um, there are expensive cameras in urban exploration. Uh, in fact, I... I, I I, I believe that Supreme, the, the sort of trendy brand or whatever, um, issued a special edition bolt cutters um, 10 years ago and sort of suggested that it was for, you know, uh, uh, urban explorers to buy. Um, clearly, there's lots of gear that one can 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 have and celebrate in climbing and, and in potholing. So maybe there's always some kind of technological 
apparatus that one can fetishize, invest in, depend upon, whatever, whatever. But anyway, bikes are big and they're bloody obvious and you can't avoid them from the scene in a way that you can some of the other kit in those other hobby practices. So is there anything in that? There, there definitely is. I, I know in my in the chapter I wrote in that Heidegger and music book, I used Heidegger's concept of tools as something that both provide a, a different, uh, the, the disappear in use. So when, his examples, when you're using a hammer, you're not, you don't think about the hammer, you are person hammer in, until of course that thing breaks and you hit your thumb. And in the same way, I think mountain bikers use the bike as a, uh, when you're really, when you, when you feel like you're really biking, the bike kind of dis disappears. When, it's, when you're not doing well, the bike reappears to you in this weird way. And it's like, what's not working? Why, are, why am I skidding around? I need to change the way I hold my brakes. But when you're really biking, you're actually then focusing on the trail and on, I'm going from this type of dirt to this type of rock. And so there's almost this disappearance of the bike as a tool um, that has a different experience of landscape than you'd have without that, without that tool. So I think that's at least one way that, that, that um, a bike could be looked at um, uh, to facilitate uh, a different experience of landscape. And is that different to how a motor biker would go out for a lovely afternoon's motorbiking because the motorbiker wants to feel the roar and is as interested in the motorbike as he is in the road and the or she in the experience. Is, is, that, is there an interesting non-parallel between the motorized roar of the motorbike and why someone is engaging with the motorbike versus the cycle bike as a, a means to an end? Or are there people who I like the, the bounce of the bike seat beneath their bottoms. I think they could probably both be analyzed through that kind of same framework of like as a as, as a in their a tool use but I would say uh, even a lot in Squamish a lot of trails were built by motos by by motorbike like dirt bike um, community but have been kind of taken over by uh, by mountain bikes. And I think that there is, there's a, a fair bit of animosity between the, the dirt bike community and the mountain bike community. They think one, each one of them thinks that it's the, an appropriate way to use a tool to experience something. I can add to that slightly. So yeah, I do think, um, like the relationship with technology is an interesting thing. <laughs> um, how many people who ride bikes spend time watching like gear videos and bike breakdown videos, right? Like, like there's a, there is a fetishization of the technology, but equally at the same time, there is the like, um, I do think, and it is interesting to point to Jeff's whole discussion around authenticity, right? But like the ability to like strip back to like the kind of bare bones experience of the bike and like how that then becomes maybe potentially more authentic, right? Like, if you're out there riding a 90s mountain bike that you've restored and like has very like old technology and stripped down right like is that more authentic in some ways or i mean even the kind of like what was a moment of the rise of like the like track bike and like then track lacrosse bikes and whatever right like that stripped down experience so there's an interesting dynamic there i as well do think it's interesting that it ties into what we were looking at with what red board doing and using point of view like you don't see the bike right like like or, or like you hear it or you see a tire in there but it's like that's really not the focus and especially like it like it kind of goes back and forth as to how they play with the bike in those videos or not right um and i do think that's interesting um within this discussion and i and i think as well like when we get to the urban exploring piece right like red bull are trying to allow you to explore without getting into the details of it too much right as well like you don't have to know about different types of mountain biking. And in fact, like the urban mountain biking pulls from maybe like a mixture of different subcultures uh, within cycling um, that I, uh, you know, it is a kind of mid space. No one owns it. And the rules are kind of like, there aren't established rules. There aren't established, like, or at least when it kind of started 
Um, it's not quite mountain biking. It doesn't quite adhere to mountain biking's requirements as much as like urban like trick forms and like BMX or whatever, right? Like it kind of pulls on a whole bunch of different stuff. I think it's kind of like indeterminability technologically, culturally, and then in terms of like, yeah, kind of you can be in many places without actually having to be there through that visual technology gaze. Like they are, that's perfect for them. <laughs> right? Like that's perfect because it can pull in anybody, right? Like it's it's not restricted and it becomes a, a perfect marketing tool for them um, that you, you you don't get cut out of it. You're not like, oh, that's, that's a BMX video. I don't do BMX or, or, you know, like uh, whatever that may be, you don't get cut from it in that way. So um, I think for, for Red Bull, that indeterminability, you know, around it is, is absolutely perfect for them. Can I ask Oliver and Jacob, um, uh, you were understandably on the fence in your chapter, I think about the influence of Red Bull and, and GoPro. And I wonder whether, is this, an opportunity well this is an opportunity for me to ask you what what are your thoughts on all of that um we talked about when we were uh when you were initially writing the chapter didn't we we talked about the work of frederick jameson and we talked about pastiche and, and i just i wonder whether this is a, a a meaningful cultural form urban downhill now or whether it's all just a nonsense that's about selling us red bull cans of red bull and more gopros and continuing to colonize parts of the world that don't really want to be colonized. What do you think? Yeah. I think my, um, I think my, yeah, go ahead, Oliver. Chime in. No, no, I'll let you go, Jake, because I just spoke for a bunch. <laughs> so. um, I guess in, in my view, yes. I, I think that there's elements of each of those. I think that, you know, that was one of the advantages that I think we were hoping would come from using this urban assemblage approach is that it allows for considering this, particular event and the bodies, spaces, technologies that are involved within it as more than one thing. Um, having said that, I do think there's a, a potential tension uh, that is there, uh, both in terms of kind of the authenticity as we've been discussing it. Uh, does this count as mountain biking, both for those uh, you know practicing it, those that are watching it? Is it still a subculture if you have most of the millions of views that those videos get from non-mountain bikers? Um, at what point does it just become content? Uh, to a certain extent. And as you kind of mentioned, I don't think Red Bull really has concerns about that. If it's content and it's, you know, even a shallow form of content, but it gets views, that's kind of part of what they're after in order to sell uh, more Red Bull. Uh, at the same time, I do think that there's a form of, I think we kind of described it in the chapter, or we've talked about it elsewhere as uh, cultural alterity. And there's kind of a, a form of difference that's at the, the root of this, both as a sport form um, all the way through the ways that the events are structured, where they where they take place, um, the athletes that are kind of in this particular world um, all speaks to, I think, something that I guess in some ways we could point to, and maybe this is a more positive view uh, or less cynical, but a, a kind of cultural hybridization, right, that is uh, maybe more unique to this particular generation uh, of, you know, the development of action sport cultures where, um, a lot of those lines between what you just described it as, right, something that sells, something that's authentic, something that's meaningful, something that's not meaningful, that those get more and more blurred. Um, and I think that's kind of one of the things that we were after is to try to uh, show how it's interesting, as Oliver mentioned, that uh, the bike is central to the activity, but in the videos, it, ne it isn't necessarily. Um, the athleticism, skill, experience uh, that is involved in the athletes is critical to it, but also not necessarily for the consumption of the video. Um, and also that the urban setting itself is something that, you know, is, is integral to how they're going to produce this event and how they want it to come across as both formal and informal in this mix so that, uh, you know, for lack of better description, you're never bored when you're watching the video, right? There's these kind of different features from what you'd expect in an urban environment to what you wouldn't expect, what you might expect during a particular sporting event. Um, I always notice, and it's just maybe a more innocuous thing, but they have all of the streets where they didn't move cars. Uh, so you have these cyclists in a world-class event for the, for the particular sport with a major corporate sponsor and sponsors. Um, but nonetheless, right, there are these kind of elements that are also very, as we would call them, kind of DIY. Um, and yeah, I think that that kind of speaks to maybe some of the ways that um, it can be both something that is uh, corporatized, but then also, you know, an emergent form of action sport that um, is more and more kind of indicative maybe of the, the postmodern cultures in which we kind of see ourselves.
Just, just to add okay. to that as well and answer your question, um, Luke, about the commingling of nature and technology. I think I, I'm a Latourian at heart. I love Latour, always have done. And what I like about Latour is, you know, he talks about following the assemblage and following the network. And that that applies really well for me when you mountain bike in the countryside and people take umbrage to you being there because the more you follow why they think that way, the more you realize what else is at stake. Um, so that the more you f follow the assemblages of mountain biking and the complaints that are made about the artificial being present in the natural, the more you realize what they're really upset about, what we're all really upset about is in the UK at least, the enclosure of public space. It's, it's not really about, you know, if we're all being honest with each other, we know the British countryside is unnatural. We know it's a socio-technical hybrid. It can't be anything but the, the, the Peak District where we live is, as you know, I think, Luke, it's it's by definition a socio-technical hybrid. It, it's something that was forged out of steel and industry. And, you know, the Rivlin Valley, which is just down from where I live, is supposedly one of the most serene and beautiful natural landscapes in the city. But is that way because of how it was uh, it was artificially created by the steel industry. So I think when you really dig down into it, what people in the UK at least are really upset about is that we're all sharing a very small space because the rest of it is owned uh, and commandeered by royals and the elite. And, and that's the thing that we should really be upset at. Um, and, and I've been reading, reading a lot of Bernard Stiegler recently and one of the terms he uses, which I like, for mountain biking is this idea of the scapegoat. I don't, I don't know what the, the French translation was, um, but he's saying essentially when you when you follow these assemblage, often more often than not, what you find is that people are angry at something because they're scapegoating you for something else. And I think mountain biking, is, mountain bikers and the reputation we've got is more often than not a scapegoat for primarily the, pro the process of enclosure and the, the commodification of space. Uh, any, uh, I'm conscious that all of the speakers have, have been talking and asking questions. Uh, Zoe, Brendan, Kev, Nick, Nicola, do you care to introduce yourselves and or ask a question? It'd be really good to know what brought you to the session today, actually, because I don't believe, other than Kev, I don't believe the rest of us have met. I know, Brendan, we've had a few uh, interactions yeah. on Twitter. Yeah, hi. Um, I guess, yeah, I'm coming in from Australia. and. Um... So it's early in the morning here, so apologies if the, I was off, off camera for a little bit, just catching up on sleep. But um, well, it looks great. Yeah, well, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's a nice spot. That's actually a place, uh, Gary, uh, Fraser Island, just off the coast, where we take my students part of my program. So we're fairly fortunate, and that's where we get to go mountain biking. So we go do some mountain biking, fat biking along the beach, which meets a whole heap of um, obstacles with the four wheel drivers. Uh, the four drivers don't like us being on the beach. We take up space, all those sort of things. Um, but I'm, I guess I'm here because I've been following your work, Jim, and we're currently doing research on um, people's motivations for recreation and connection to the natural environment, particularly across three sort of areas, mountain biking, climbing, and bushwalking. It's because of a lot of discussions in Australia, and particularly in Southeast Queensland, where I'm based, around access um, mountain bikers are held to be the ones that are detrimental to all of these areas, closely followed by climbers. And obviously in our area, uh, bushwalkers are held as the um, the ones that are most naturally sensitive. And um, so we're doing some research on that. And today our research is indicating across all of those formats, there's very little difference in terms of their um, connection to the environment in terms of their desire for preservation, conservation and engagement and their level of um conservation actions so the mountain bikers are, are in many ways more um uh, notable in the sense of being proactive in attempting to do conservation because of their concerns of how they're viewed by uh the land managers so what you just mentioned jim about land management that's our biggest biggest issue so where they're closing trails where they're um, providing access Going back a little bit to some of the other conversations, I was interested to listen to that notion of how the interaction between the bike and the human and the engagement with the place 
in Australia, we're having a lot of mountain bikes parks built. And with that comes these subsets of, well, you can only ride in that bike park if you have 160 mils of travel, or you can only, you, so it's a real, creating some real divisions in, you know, well, you can't be here, you're only on a single speed or you've only got 110 mils or those and sort that's, of things. that's formalised or, or is that just uh, an info? No, it's not formalised. It becomes a, it becomes a sense of the community. So people put in information, hey, I'm thinking about riding at X bike park. And then there's this, oh, you can't go there if you, whereas previously when I started mountain biking back in the 90s, it was, oh, you've got a bike, let's go and ride. It didn't matter where. So there's all of these sort of nuanced, uh, Jeff, what you were sort of talking about and others, those collective communities within communities, and then they create these subcultures of rules, which is quite interesting that's coming about and um, a bit of a shame in some ways because in some ways they're limiting. Um, it's great to have diversity in trails, but it's also a bit of a shame that maybe there's some barriers to where people go and ride because it's perceived that you don't have the right bike. But um, we also have the sub subcultures of going back to single speeding versus the enduro bikes and all the different things that go on. But, but thank you for, you know, it's been great waking up early in the morning and listening to all these different ideas. So. Oh, good. I'm, I'm glad it wasn't too much of an inconvenience. Um, it's just a shame that I, I think we didn't meet earlier, Brendan, because it would have been great to have you as, as part of the book. But I'm hoping that these discussions will continue in the future. And, and obviously, uh, you know, um, I'll, I'll make sure that we include you in all of those discussions. Yeah, appreciate it. And the, whereas this, we, we're just literally, literally analysing the data from our research. So um, when that comes about, I'll make sure I'll share. And uh, yeah, obviously, anytime there's a chance to be in a book, Happy to be involved. So. Okay, then, Luke, I think, um, yeah, I don't want to be keeping people away into the night or early in the morning, in Brendan's case. Um, if, I, if I could just finish by uh, punting the next, I've, I've actually got two book launches on the go. There's this one and there's the one on the 18th of January, which is going to be a hybrid session. So, um, and it will include three completely different presentations from three of the other, three other authors um, and contributors to the book. So we've got a session by Tavis Smith um, in Canada around um, how trail building could contribute to reparations between um, indigenous populations and settlers, um, which would be really interesting. A session by Tom Campbell um, from Edinburgh Napier University on sustainability and sustainable trail building practice. And then uh, Kev Bingham asked, asked a question earlier on the chat about electric bikes and whether they're changing the face of mountain biking. Indeed, they are, for better or for worse, as, as many of you will know. Um, Leslie Ingram Sills, also from Edin Edinburgh Napier University, is going to be presenting some of her work from the British Cycling funded study on e-mountain bikes in the UK in that session as well. Um, I guess all that's left for me to say is thank you everybody for, thank you contributors um, for contributing to the book. This is the first time we've actually spoken face to face, I think since we started writing those chapters a long time ago. So, and, and I said this before about other editor collections, but the strength of any editor collection, of course, is always based on how good the authors are. And I'm genuinely pleased to say that um, I'm proud of every one of the, the chapters that we've included in the book and, and, and think that they make a real contribution both to the study of our growing sub-discipline, but also to uh, lots of respective disciplines as well, including geography, psychology, sociology, philosophy, and so on. Um, and thanks to people who have come, uh, either gotten up early in the morning or stayed up late at night uh, and probably sacrificed a lot to be here. And thank you finally to Luke, as ever, for facilitating the session. Really appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. Uh, just a very final word from me. Um, unless somebody contacts me within the next 24 hours to say that they do want me to edit the um, uh, video recording of this session, which will set things back in time terms. Uh, I'll hope to have the uh, recording up on the YouTube site by early part of next week, and I'll send around a, a, an email via the um, uh, the registration site just to say that it's available, and then not bother you beyond that point unless you ask me to add, a, add you to our mailing list. 
Um, so thank you very much, everybody. I've really enjoyed it. And the great thing about doing this thing online is that we can pull people out of bed or keep them up late at night um, uh, around the world for the greater greater elucidation of all of us. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, night, evening, whatever it might be where you are. Thank you very much. Thanks, Luke. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.